Gordon. <sighs> Are right, we back? Hell black again. Video episode. We got a legend in the house, but before we pass the mic, uh, you know, go to our Patreon, patreon.com slash hellblackpod. Go to our Apple Podcast, subscribe, Spotify, give us a review. Shout out to the three people that listened <laughs> to the last episode and gave us a review. Appreciate y'all. 4,000 of y'all listened to it, but only three people gave a review. You know, y'all got to do better. Hit up. put this content out for y'all, so you yeah. know what I'm saying? Just be reciprocated, because I know 4,000 of y'all ain't on our Patreon, so... At least y'all could do is support for a couple of minutes, man. Write that review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, five stars, subscribe. You know what I'm saying? Support the movement. Subscribe on YouTube specifically. We need to really build out this platform because um, it's a lot of nonsense under the banner of revolutionary nationalism <laughs> and revolutionary pan-Africanism. So y'all got to uh, help us spread this because I know y'all see it. I know y'all see it. The Stuff that's supposed to be pro black. We got the analytics. So. <laughs> you know? so help us spread this. But now to our very esteemed guest. Legendary in the house. The Oakland legend, Guapale. How you doing? I'm Thanks good. It's good. it's good to see you guys again. Yeah, we've been playing it cool, but I'm a big ass fan. So I'm juiced. Me too. I'm happy for my <laughs> I got a younger sister, me and her. Uh we're gonna talk about some of the songs that we really like, which I'll We'll say our guapole deep cuts. Okay. Because I'm pretty sure. Yeah. But I'm a big fan of your ad libs and the runs that you make. We're going to talk about <laughs> that. But, uh, this is the second time she's on the podcast with us. The first one, if you haven't heard, go to that Tales of the yes, Town. You know episodes saying? four and five. Tap, Tap in. in. Yes. Re listen to that. You know, we put a lot of hard work, but I'm excited to give you your due. You know what I'm saying? To have this video YouTube episode, you know, where we can really uh, tap in and get to know you more. And, and our listeners could, uh, Hopefully learn some more about you. You know, of course, they're already familiar with your music, you know, but getting to know more about you as the artist and, and your development and, and how it's been over the years. They might not be familiar, especially with some of these college students that listen to our podcast. That's they might true. not know. That's true. And some people just know of Closer and it might even not even be from my version. It might be from somebody else's remix and they might not know I've put out like five albums since and you know so i appreciate you saying some some album cuts yeah closer is not my favorite song by you so <laughs> <Okay>. that's like <laughs> yeah. honestly that's refreshing yeah so can you tell us a bit about your uh, introduction to music you know we know you went to an art school in elementary you know then berkeley music school in boston not in berkeley california you know mm -hmm. and, and was it something that was you know laid out for you by your parents or is it something that, you know, kind of developed naturally? And, and what was your focus uh, when he was at Berkeley? Yeah. Um, yeah, I was born in Oakland, but grew up in Berkeley and in Oakland and the Berkeley L-E-Y. And then I ended up going to Berkeley College of Music, L-E-E. -E. And um, I just, I always loved arts. I always loved music. I always loved creative expression, you know, even... I used to paint when I was younger, do dance classes and just all of that. And I think my parents supported just in terms of bringing us to live shows, you know, even if it was mainly for adult <laughs> audiences, you know what I mean? It's like before they were calling things all ages, they would just expose us to music and music was always playing in the house and my family was very into art so i just felt like it was up there and respected just like any other profession and so it felt like it was accessible and i was just always drawn to it and i would say you know i started studying music more in high school and singing with the um Oakland Youth Choir and getting like some training. And then I applied to Berkeley College of Music in Boston because I knew I wanted to get just deeper into it. And I wanted to learn how to write songs and I wanted to learn to, you know, perform with a band and how can I work with musicians and how can I learn about the business and not be taken advantage of. So um, I, I went out there and luckily got to like start recording and creating with some of the most 
amazing musicians and producers of our time. You know, I was in an ensemble, a James Brown ensemble with Jeff Basker, who's uh, one of the top producers, period. He works with Bruno Mars and Beyonce and Alicia Keys and all these different folks. And um, I got to meet Keith Harris, who I ended up um, also recording with, you know, he did my Strong as Glass album. Um, Deontony Parks, I, I got to meet Krasno from Soul Life. So it was just like where a foundation of excellent musicians and producers and starting to um, collab, you know, some of it was like school assignments, but I was like, I'm going to work towards making this a real song because I'm about to put it on my album when I get home. <laughs> You know, yeah, yeah. and it just kind of came together organically. And I thought you had like the right mindset going in, like going in there to get what you need. You know what I'm saying? So how did you yeah. have that? Like what led you to having like that mindset to go in, like, hey, I'm going to get what I want. Like, all right, this might be my school assignment, but this is about to be my yeah. album too. So like, what, what, yeah, <laughs> what was because, that process like for you? I think that um, coming from the Bay Area, I feel like it's kind of a, a indie environment where it's like create your own path. We don't have to, we can break the mold. We can make our own rules. We can, so I just feel like I, I, I didn't have a lot of pressure from my parents to do things traditionally. So I just, I mean, Berkeley's the only school I applied to. And I just decided like, this is where I want to go. This is where, and it wasn't really about coming out with a degree or I didn't even care that much about graduating. I just knew what I wanted to become in my life. And it was just like, by any means necessary, I'm about to figure this out. And, um, and I feel like my family like pulled together and supported and just trusted, you know what I mean? That so the, that the vision was going to work. And if it didn't, you know, I would try something else, but I really wanted to just have some more discipline and um, skills in something that I've always loved. Yeah. I was talking to Pilo and I was, urging him to go to music school. I mean, he's already a decorated producer, uh, songwriter, yeah. rapper, but with music Super being cool. such a low entry level, uh, I just think oftentimes that since people only need, you know, $200 to go to a studio session or a couple thousand to buy their own equipment, uh, they get these very, uh, I guess like mic microscopic understandings of music. Whereas you go to like a, 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 a music school where you're able to get introduced to the business side of things, the marketing side of things, the songwriting side, side of things, the production side of things. I think those are things that while you may get experience, I guess like naturally over the course of you know years, decades of being in an industry, if you're able to go to a, spa a space that's specific for that and can really hone you into those things, that's where I can see uh, some like qualitative you know leaps happening. Yeah, I mean, I think there's something to be said for getting training and having mentors and having teachers and, and all of that structure. And it really helped me, but it was also a different time to be honest with you. Like it was the light, the late nineties for me that I was going to Berkeley and like to get Pro Tool, you know, there wasn't Garage Band and there wasn't yeah. Fruity Loops and there wasn't Logic and all of these different programs. I couldn't record voice ideas on my phone, you know? So it was really expensive. Like if you wanted to buy Pro Tools, it was thousands of dollars. Um, if you wanted to record something of quality, you had to, I mean, it would cost a lot of money to set up. And now I feel like people can learn on YouTube and do so much from home that you would have needed a label or a big ass setup, you know what I mean, to pull off. So, um, and then there's also, you know, different ways that, I mean, some people are learning to play instruments on YouTube that didn't exist before, you know? So I think for me, like definitely like 
as a singer, getting some vocal training, which I did before, during, and after Berkeley. Um, I did a little bit of learning piano, but I, I was never disciplined with that. I strongly encourage musicians out there and vocalists to, if you can work on an instrument, I just, I admire people so much. I think that it really expands the songwriting. Um, I think what was most valuable for me is the relationships that I made there with other students. It was the most excellent, talented musicians from all over the world that went to be there. And so it just raised the bar so much. And the exposure for me, um, just the starting place and the and the basic minimum was at such a high level that yeah. it just like made me had to up my game. And that was like one of the best things that I could have learn there because I feel like especially the Bay Area has such a laid back vibe. Sometimes it's just like anything goes and it's like we have something really raw that can't be taught. You know, there's a vibe and a feeling. But I think when it comes to craft and hustle, that's not like for me, like I fed off that East Coast energy and just like a collective of talented people from all over the world to really be like, this is what it's supposed to look like, you know? So some of my first songwriting, um, you know, things that I was working on was like musicians and producers that were knew way more than I did, you know, that I was able to go to like Jeff Basker and stuff. Yeah, I just think it's often that since it's so since stuff is so accessible and so easy to get to and so easy to, to enter, uh, people don't fully appreciate it and understand all the things that go into it, right? Like Abbas and I both play uh college sports, right? Uh and it was going to college that showed me like how much really went into being a productive football player on a division one level. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, in high school, I might've been able to get away with all this, but then you get around people like, okay, they lift, they got nutrition, they got film. You know what I'm saying? Like you they realize there's levels to it. Things to sustain you, mm -hmm. right? Because there's the, the talent, but then there's like, okay, the drive and the discipline, and then there's skills and technique to sustain you so that you can last. I mean, that's one of the most valuable things, or or just how to work smarter. Cause it's like, you, you can learn stuff on your own, you know, from all over the place, but um, it just, it takes, it takes a while to, to collect all that knowledge, right? Yeah, I just don't, I don't think people understand how much actually goes in into starting and sustaining a career in the music industry, whether you're talking about management, whether you're talking about producing, whether you're talking about singer, songwriter, performer, like it's a lot that go into it. Uh, it's yeah. much more than just being able to sing, <laughs> rap, you know? For sure. For sure. Because there's so many talented people out in the world that just don't get the exposure or their life circumstances get in the way, you know, yeah. or the stars don't align, or maybe they don't have the discipline or the drive, but they have so much talent, but it's definitely more than talent that will sustain you, you know, even being surrounded by good people and making smart choices. You know what I mean? Yeah. One thing we need to state before I go on to the next question is that you and I uh, are both alum of the same elementary school and so we should probably do some oh. we should probably do some lobbying on this episode for us to get you know, yes which which school you went to Ars Magna, to? right mm -hmm. yeah, you know we need, we should get like a classroom or a library or something we got we got That's a lobby awesome. to get something named after us yeah <laughs> for real wow that was a special school yeah i'm bro i was telling the boss like instrument was required uh yeah we had dance with miss betty and it was like Really, a lot of African dance, um, drums. Yeah. It was, it was nuts. Yeah, yep. I know because I think about you know I I like I told you I don't really play an instrument, but I remember Carolyn Brandy led this samba class and had, I mean, this is like 
fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. She had us sounding amazing. We were performing with Sheila E. and Pete Escovita. You know what I mean? I learned how to play the tambourine, the bells. The, it's You never know what it's um, instilling in you, even if that's not the path you choose. And you're right. I mean, we're doing South African dance, modern dance. It was just like, I feel like the individualism too was really pushed there. Yeah, so if y'all listening, uh, Berkeley Unified School District, y'all need to <laughs> tap in. <you know. laughs> uh, but you've accomplished much in your in your very long career. Um, has your career gone the way you planned it to? Um, and so, and what are some things you're still looking to accomplish after all these years? Yeah. Um, well, my first plan in my career was just to be able to do what I love. And um, so I accomplished just being able to still be here and actually still love it. So that feels really good. I don't feel like I'm finished at all. I feel like, um, you know, my goal in the beginning might have been to sell 100,000 records. That seemed huge to me when I had never sold one before. But you know, now over time and just, you know, being five or six albums deep and still at it. Now I'm excited to, you know, with this next album, have it not just be about the music, but it's also about the senses and the colors and the smells that relate to the songs and having specialized merchandise and like just growing as a entrepreneur and getting to connect to more people and collab with more people. I feel like every stage I get, I could see like, oh, you know, I, I want to go further. And um, so I think that keeps me humble and I'm super grateful um, that it's been this many years. So you was talking a little bit about your, your marketing, especially I'm sure a lot has changed with uh, marketing from when you started your career to now when you have got a, a TikTok dances and, you know, you got people faking it on social I media. I pray I never see you trying to, you know, on, on TikTok dance in Guapale. You, you're too good of a singer. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be mad if my songs are playing on TikTok. <laughs> so uh, how intentional are you with your marketing, you know, rollout for your records? And, you know, are you setting out to make these big records or, you know, do you just create and... And with the record do the talking? Um, I think I've never been one to, I, I wouldn't know if a song was going to be big, honestly, until it's out and it's like what people lean towards and, and people are supporting it. I think I don't like putting pressure on myself to make a big record. That's just always seemed really intimidating for me. And um, as a singer songwriter, it's just more like, you know, I'm writing what I feel, you know, and it comes together more naturally. But I think I am always trying to figure out how can the song be as strong as possible. So, you know, I mean, I take my time with, with each thing and I definitely rely on the producers I work with and the musicians that I work with to um, make sure it's as big as it can be, you know? So if it does get played on repeat, I can listen to it and be proud, you know? And, um, and I want it to spark something in other people. So I think in the beginning, I didn't used to pay attention to marketing. It felt like just like the business side. And I, I more left that to the folks around me. Um, I think this project with this colors project, I have more of a vision that um, I can just see it all a little more. And I think because it ha it's more about the senses and just like my my senses blend like when i it's like synesthesia when i hear something it looks a certain way in my mind and 
I wanted to go farther with this one and like really how can I let people he hear the music and feel it how I feel it. And I love, um, you know, I'm into aromatherapy and all that kind of stuff. So it was like, even like, we're going to, you know, introduce a candle scent that goes with the song and has a color and just like really invite people into a mood. So because this is more of a creative expression or extension of that, I'm way more involved in it than I normally would be and even the album artwork i got to i'm getting to collaborate with this artist from the bay area um human she's a filipino woman just super talented she just designed the warriors uniforms but she's been doing amazing murals and all kinds of collaborations and um so i feel like you know even from the painting um, on down, it's getting to be a, a really thoughtful, intentional process. It's dope to hear that after all these years, uh, you still finding new ways to get involved, right? Uh, new ways to expand, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's the business, whether it's the art, the creativity, because there's not, but outside of living there, there isn't anything I've been doing for, you know, 20 years. I think <laughs> with our generation, it's so easy to feel like you got like the short window to do stuff. You know, and that, that's very much to our own yeah. detriment. Like when we just did the Tales of the Town project, right? Like in my mind, I'm like, damn, this is for some reason I just feel like this is the I know talent and skill wise isn't the biggest thing that we can do, but it just feels like you don't really get that many opportunities, right? I, I don't know. You're trying to make the most out of every opportunity. Well, I think there's something to be it's kind of a trust the process thing. You know what I mean? Like you can there's something about, you know, like we have our goals and I think as we accomplish it and seize that moment, then you can see that's not the highest that you can get, but it'll take you to the next thing. And sometimes you can't even see what's the biggest thing at the end, but it's like the steps each way will, will take you there. And then, I don't know. I mean, I wasn't imagining myself this long later. I, I couldn't have imagined that. I just had to go with it, you know? So you, you really that living proof of trust the process. You're like, yeah, uh, I, <laughs> I did it. Yeah, <laughs> and you know, how to keep it relevant to myself and how it can keep meaning something to me and keep trying to live a full life. And, you know, sometimes I wait a while in between albums because I want to have something to say. I want to be inspired, you know, um, because it's really personal to me. You know, it's not just a job. Like I want to share like what I care about with you guys, not just, you know, some whatever. <laughs> and I think it's a byproduct of this system, right? That makes you feel like everything is on borrowed time. I guess that's more so what I'm getting at. It's just like, I only got so much time to get this yeah, done. I can't even fathom. Of this right moment, the right yeah. way. Otherwise, it might not ever come back, you know? Yeah, like, of course, if you live in, you're going to have something mm. to talk about. You're going to have something to contribute. Uh, so I guess it's more so like not necessarily being able to see myself be 40, 50 years old sometimes. Yeah. 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 And I think there's something to be said for creative people and that drive that does make it feel urgent. You know, and if it didn't feel urgent, we probably wouldn't do any of it, you know? So I guess it's necessary in a certain yeah. way. So now we're gonna talk about some of my favorite records that aren't closer, that aren't milk, that aren't milk All and right. honey. <laughs> uh, so you know how like Apple Music will do like the essentials, right? For like an artist. So if you made Guapale's yeah. essentials with tears on my pillow and the one Will Mac Maul make the list? Oh, Mac Maul. Um, I tears on my pillow. I think maybe it would just because I felt I feel like um that felt like a classic song to like me. A, that would that, was, would that be considered a ballad? 
It is kind of a ballad, but then like it still hits hard with the drums Anger. and it was, I've always loved blues. I mean, I love R&B, but I love rhythm and blues. You know what I mean? Like I liked that that song felt like an old school sample and like kind of a throwback soulful kind of thing. And I enjoy doing it live. So I think that's always like an added extra for me, like there's recording the songs and then there's doing it live and having that exchange with the audience. You know what I mean? That adds to, I don't know, it having a life, you know? Um, so yeah, I don't always think, it's hard to think of my own music like as a outsider, but every now and then when I listen, I'm like, okay, I'm proud of that one. Yeah, that's that's one of the, the first time I heard it was actually live, and I'm like, "What the fuck is this?" <laughs> oh my God. Oh, I, I was it. like, "What is this?" It was crazy, crazy. Oh, I yeah, love it was, it was that. the song. I think that. Well, I mean, your live show sh showed me how well you can actually sing, like you can really blow. But that song in particular, because there's nothing mm. hiding your voice. Like there's there's yeah, mm. it was a very strong song. That's probably yeah. Oh, I love I now, what about the one? That. I appreciate Mac Mall. <laughs> the one I mean, I I love Mac Mall. Um, he's a you know, a Bay Area legend. And I'm trying to think, I don't even know if we've performed that song live, but that was Pretty early on, that was probably like fifteen. Yeah, I was gonna say it was a lot of like me and my friends, like, uh, like a love song for us. You know what I'm saying? Like we was probably like fourteen, fifteen when yeah. that song came out. Yeah, because see, I always loved Wide oh, Open. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> so you know, it was like in high school when he did that, but I always loved that. So I was happy we got to collab and you know wanted to do something kind of with that vibe that felt like a love song, but it was still the beat. And I remember, gosh, I think I was pregnant with my daughter at the time, who's now Damn. 16. So that shows you how long that was. Because I remember he wanted to do a video for it. And I was like, I can't do the video right now because I'm pregnant. And I, I don't know if that's the He right had the vision. He knew that was one of the ones. <laughs> He was. He was. He was mad at me because I couldn't do the video. But I was just like, I just, I was like, probably like eight months pregnant. You know what I mean? And now it's nice to see. I just love how many um, women artists are like. You know, it's like Rihanna's out here looking sexy and pregnant, and it's just like you can still you can still work and you're not, I feel like the whole narrative is changed so much. I feel like when I was performing pregnant years ago, it was, I felt like it was kind of shocking to people. Yeah, You know what I mean? And I didn't really know how to address it because I was just like, you know, I love music, but I for sure want to be a mother. I for sure want a full life. And I liked having privacy. So it was kind of like this blending of two worlds that I didn't quite, you know, know how to do and was kind of like keeping it separate. But I would like walk out there pregnant. People would be like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then people were asking me like, what are you going to do? Like after you have a kid, like, are you still good? And I was just like, I'm going to do all of this. But I don't know how. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just figure it out. How have you, you know? balanced that? You know, being a being a mother in your music career. Um, I think it's just a constant balance for me because it's the two most important things to me. You know, family and my love of music, and both of them take one hundred, one thousand percent. So. My, my timing is a little crazy sometimes, but it's like, you know, I have to travel and be at shows sometimes and I have to prioritize that sometimes, but also like picking up my daughter from school and, you know, being at her recitals and being just present is 
invaluable to me. So sometimes, you know, that is going to trump showing up at a event or going to the studio that day or whatever. And I just, I have to keep it balanced for my own sanity and quality of life. So you've got a lot of game over the years, over, over, you know, the decades and whatnot. So do you be a mentoring younger artists? Do you be a mentoring a lot of artists? Um, I think not officially, but there's a lot of artists that I talk to and just try and be really honest about, you know, what I think can help keep you sustainable. Um, and just not burning bridges, you know, cause people come back around in this industry if you're lucky to be in it a long time and, you know, not spending all your money at once um, and creating your own levels of success. So you're not just trying to measure up or be let down, you know, by other people's standards. And, um, and also taking your craft seriously, you know? Um, and I know it meant so much to me, like the folks that unofficially mentored me and, you know, getting advice from Prince and getting advice from the folks in Souls of Mischief that, you know, helped us with our first distribution deal and, you know, DJ Fuse from Digital Underground and E40 and, let us see and Martin Luther, I mean, Raphael Sadiq, there's so many folks that just kind of put me on game and just told me little things that I feel like has helped my perspective, you know, throughout this. Yeah. So a lot of folks, you know, to get to closer, you know, they, they don't know that it was a, a freestyle, you know? So can you tell us uh, the story of that record and why you think it's, such a, a timeless record? I think it was, um, I think Closer just captures a feeling. And it was the last song that I did on my first EP. And I just had this feeling of like, I'm on my way somewhere. I'm finally, you know, getting to share this music. I don't know what genre it is. I don't know where I fit in, even how, you know, I look and I felt like, you know, Lauren Hill was like the only other public person, her and Erica that had dreads. You know what I mean? It was just like all these things of not knowing if it was going to work, but being excited at the same time and feeling just like trusting some kind of faith, but also feeling kind of insecure of like, I don't know if the music is as good as I want it to be or if it's good enough. And so Amp Live um, from Zion I that I had been working with at the time um, did the music with Mike Tiger and brought it to me. And he was like, I think you're going to feel this vibe. And as soon as I went home and played it, I don't know, like the higher, closer to my dreams part just felt like it was writing itself and it just captured the feeling. And a couple days later, I went to his home studio and just was like, let me just try and just sing a few things and then I'll write it and come back and revisit it. But I don't know. It was just kind of one of those things that wrote itself because I think it was just an honest moment of what so many of us as artists, anyone created, anyone trying to get to the next level in their life, I think, go through. Because now that I've talked to people over the years and it's like different musicians, aspiring actors, people trying to, you know, pass the bar in law school or um, just have faith to get to that next step. They were like, I listened to this and that helped me through because I think we all have that struggle in us, you know, and there's like a time when you know you want what you want to do, but to get there, 
it can be a long it's what process, they would call ghetto gospel you know <laughs> you know it's a very it's a very it's a very mm. spiritual song uh just not mm. necessarily attached to any religion but like i feel it and i feel like a spirit within me you yeah. know what i'm saying <laughs> they're very oh, spiritual like, song like i was talking mm. in the tales of the town i was like yeah when i'm down i, I listen that. to it i'm up i listen to it so it's like if i'm down you know like, yeah i'm gonna turn that on if i'm up it's like it's like that duality in that song it's like, all right it's yeah going. It's gonna keep me going. I'm celebrating, yeah. but, you know. I might be depressed, it's, and I'm listening to it. So it's just, hey, it's one on one. <laughs> oh, I love that. Both of those moments, but I think that's like, I think it was me not being afraid to feel vulnerable and just being hella honest. And the honesty is, it's both those parts exist at the same time. Like we can act like it's all good and all confident and all that, but it's just. For me, that's not real. It's always a, a mixture of both. You know? Yeah, I'm jealous. I hope that one day. I mean, I don't, only time will tell. Maybe what we did with tells of the town is something that could withstand the test of time. You know, like yeah. that desire sure. to reach one's full potential is something that's going to always exist throughout humanity. So as long as we have access to a record like Closer, it's something that people going to resonate with. Shit, it's like yeah, for generations to come. Thank you. you, do, yeah, Thank you. I mean, do you feel that I way about the record? That. I mean, you know, you made it. I feel like um, I'm just so grateful that it stood the test of time. That was my goal. I mean, that's always my goal with music. Like, can I make something timeless? But you honestly just never yeah. know. You know what I mean? It's like, I'm going to do the best that I can. I hope that it's timeless. I'm pouring my heart into this, but it constantly amazes me to be honest with you i didn't expect that so this is a question that i'm very excited to ask where does yoshi's rank on your list of favorite venues to play because i know we've both been to some of your shows at yoshi's well, yeah i think well that's at home you know what i mean so it always feels good just to have a bay area crowd I like that it's an intimate space where people will really listen. I mean, you can see almost everybody's face in the room. So it's kind of like, you know, being at home in my hometown, in my living room. That's kind of how it feels. But then, you know, on certain nights, my favorite nights is like when people turn up and the energy is just electric, you know, um, and then Yoshi's is a place that I grew up going to, even when it was in Berkeley. Like I used to see Herbie Hancock there and Hima Sakela there. Um, and then, you know, it's where I saw Lettucey. I know even, you know, Dave Chappelle and Mos Def and Bilal and all these folks have done incredible shows there. So it's when I think about going on to that stage, even though it's a small room, it's filled you, with so much Do you know, history. Usher, personally, you should lobby for him to get in there. <laughs> tell, tell Usher to come to Yoshi's. <laughs> That'll be crazy. Man, Usher, Usher is doing his thing in Vegas. Usher is such a consummate performer. I mean, he's he's one of the greats. And just like what he can do live, I mean, what he can do recorded, but then I'm what he can he'll do set live on fire. is mind. Right? He will. I've seen set John it on B fire. there too. I like. Yeah, it's you know he just did yeah, like four John B. four days in a row, three shows, all of them sold out. Four days. That one. Yeah. 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 I. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing though, because it's kind of a small space, so. Normally, if I go there, it'll be like. Why do you eight choose that over like a, a fox? Row. So it's tiring. Actually, I'm going to be doing the fox soon. And um, it's just a, a total different space and a different experience. But I have to say, the fox is one of my favorite venues in the Bay just because it's so beautiful. It's like a classic theater. I think it's from the 20s. But folks can stand up too. And I've seen such dope shows there. So I'm actually looking forward to Have you done a headline in that space. 
I haven't been a headliner there before. I did a show with Erica there before, and I did a show with Lettucey there before. And I think I did another show that I cannot remember, but I haven't done it as a headliner. So I'm looking forward to, to doing that. Very exciting. Yeah. Probably will be there. So <laughs> definitely, definitely excited. Yeah, I hope <laughs> so. Excited. So, you know, you mentioned about some, so. some new music coming out. You got a, a big marketing package. You talk about some, some candles coming with it. You know what I'm saying? So uh, what can we expect? Yeah. Um, well, the new project is coming out this summer and it's called Colors and it's something that I worked on, you know, starting over the pandemic and just really got to take my time with. Um, I got to work with some of my favorite producers and musicians, Bedrock and Errol Cooney and Chris Dave and Mike Auberg and just a lot of dope people and it's super vibey, super moody. And I'm just excited that I get to introduce it, um, appealing to the different senses, you know, and that it's expanding even outside of just sound, but, you know, sight will be included and even doing, you know, merch that, is connected specifically to songs and scents that are connected to certain moods and songs. And I just want to leave people with a feeling and get to connect. I feel like there's just so much coming at us in the world and just so much noise that it's like, I just kind of wanted to hone in and slow down and give people with a leave people with a last yeah, it sounds like the project going to be very uh, centering you know is it an ep yeah. or, or album yeah it's an album and um i'm a, about to put out this song called time heals um and it has a candle and all that and collaborated with the um, artist human that does amazing work um, about a, you know, there's a painting that correlates with it. And it's just about, you know, how things don't always seem to make sense, but in due time, it all comes together and it just like, the sun is gonna rise. The sun is gonna rise tomorrow, it's gonna be all right. And um, there's also a song, Purple, that um, I recorded that's kind of like heavily inspired or influenced by Prince. And um, I just got to do a video for it, which I'm really excited about because I haven't done a music video in a long time. And my friend Omari Hardwick is featured in it and he's just so dope. And so I'm just, yeah. I'm excited to to finally share some new music. This is my. Do you have any features on it? I know you mentioned a, a bunch of like uh, producers you worked with. Yeah, no um, features on it. But I am like I'm in the studio now, um, kind of slowly working on the next project, and I am collaborating with different people. But for this project, I just wanted to keep it. Yeah, super That's personal. Who, who are some yeah. of your favorite, uh, I guess, yeah. like singer songwriters right now? Mm, I would say her, um, Alex Isley, um, SZA, uh, Jasmine Sullivan, um. I listen to a lot of Afrobeats. So, you know, even folks like T Y Savage and, you know, yeah. Davido and his kid. And I don't know if you call <laughs> them singer songwriters, but they're alive. Last year. So it was the Afrobeats be going, they be going up. You just start moving, you don't even realize you're moving. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Um, so yeah. My playlists are are 
all you listen to any singers there. from the Bay outside of like her and and Raj and Kaylani? Um, there's also I'm trying to think because I just went to um. Gosh, I just went to her show the other day. Um, what's that song? Love it when you call me baby. Mm -hmm. I'm baby. Oh, okay, I'm gonna have to. Her her name's gonna take a minute to come to me, but she's from the Bay Area, and I just went to her show like in Silver Lake the other day. That's terrible. I can't you listen to Samaria at all? Now. I have to look it up. Samaria. Samaria. You should listen to her. She raw. Yeah, no. she went to. Uh, Game. But I'm going to be honest with you, there's a lot of people that I them. listen to and I might yeah. not <laughs> know the name, but I'm like listening to them on my playlist. That's why I'm like the song called I'm Baby. But Samaria I, I is raw. She probably like 25, 26. Uh, she from Berkeley. What high school did you go to? Mm. She went to Skyline. Okay, she went. She went to B. Skyline. She went to Beehive. She yeah, raw. You should. You should check her out. Okay. Yeah, there's so many folks that are dope out of the Bay Area. I mean, I've worked with Raj a lot, and you know, Keith. Like, there's not a lot of people yeah, that have Raj come out of Berkeley, yeah. California. You know, representing, but it's a. It's a feeling and I'm so, it makes me feel good to see folks like that, like getting exposure nationally and internationally and like that folks can tap into that vibe even that are outside of so the Bay Area now. what advice would you now, give you know? You know, to these younger artists, you know, coming out of the Bay Area? Um, I would say like, have a vision, you know, and let it keep expanding. Um, it's important to believe in yourself, but be humble too. And I think like in the beginning, sometimes it's worth it to like work for free just to get like build your audience, you know what I mean? And be willing to start somewhere instead of feeling like it needs to start in a certain place because it's like if you keep getting stronger and doing your thing and building an audience like the money will come but it's i feel like success doesn't happen overnight and a lot of times you know a lot of folks that are extremely successful they've been putting in work for years and just people don't know it you know what i mean it's behind the scenes but like don't don't be afraid of that because it's like it's it's giving you skills and i think just having a good team around you um working with trustworthy people um and yeah not like i don't know and and trust the process yeah we need to take heat of that myself i need to take heat of that myself yeah. The, the next time you come, uh, are you going to be in the Bay Area yeah. soon? You, you got to come out to people's programs and, and do some work with us. For yeah, sure. Make sure I would love tap to. tap in with you so you can come see our space and uh, see some, get real familiar with, with some of the work that we do. Uh, I, I appreciate what you guys are doing. Send some more merch your way as well. So appreciate it. So tap in yeah. SoundCloud, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Patreon. Go to our YouTube, you know what I'm saying? If you're watching our YouTube, don't just watch it. Subscribe, you know what I'm saying? So you get that notification. So patreon.com slash help. <laughs> we also didn't get a release date. You said it comes out this summer. So if you want to say when folks should have access to it. Okay. We give you an exact <laughs> day. Um, uh, it's being out right now. And it's colors, but right? But it is this summer. <laughs> Stream colors whenever it drops. Stream and yes. buy. Yes. So appreciate Please. you.